Hi everybody, Ricky here from Behind the Bars TV. Hope everybody is fit and well. Welcome to my channel. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about life without parole. And life without parole was introduced in 1983 and it was reserved for the most heinous of crimes. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about John Straffen. But before I get into it, I would just like to say a massive thanks to all my subscribers for your continuing support. But 80% of my viewers are still not subscribed to this channel. So if you are one of them, please go down and hit the subscribe button only if you are enjoying the content. John Thomas Straffen was a British serial killer who was the longest serving prisoner in British history after killing two young girls in the summer of 1951. He was found unfit to plead at trial and committed to Broadmoor Hospital. During a brief escape in 1952, he killed again. This time, Straffen was convicted of murder and sentenced to death. Reprieved because of his mental state, he had his sentence commuted to life imprisonment. Straffen remained in prison until his death after 55 years, 3 months and 26 days of incarceration. John Straffen's father, John Straffen Sr., was a soldier in the British Army. The younger Straffen was the third child in the family. His older sister was regarded as a high-grade mental defective who died in 1952. Straffen was born at Borden Camp in Hampshire, where his father was then based. When Straffen was two years old, his father was posted abroad and the family spent six years in India. Returning to the United Kingdom in March 1938, Straffen's father took a discharge from the army and then family settled in Bath, Somerset. In October 1938, Straffen was referred to a child guidance clinic for stealing and truancy. In June 1939, he first came before juvenile court for stealing a purse from a girl and was given two years probation. Straffen's probation officer found that he did not understand the difference between right and wrong or the meaning of probation. The family was living in crowded lodgings at the time and Straffen's mother had no time to help so the probation officer took the boy to a psychiatrist. As a result, Straffen was classified as a mental defective under the Mental Deficiency Act 1927. A report was compiled on Straffen in 1940 which assessed his IQ as 58 and placed his mental age at 6. From June 1940, the local council sent Straffen to a residential school for mentally defective children, St. Joseph's School in Sambon, Warwickshire. Two years later, he moved to Bestford Court, a senior school. Straffen was observed as a solitary boy who took correction very badly. At age 14, he was suspected of strangling two geese. At age 16, the school authorities undertook a review which found his IQ was 64 and his mental age was nine years, six months, recommending his discharge. Straffen returned home to Bath in March 1946, where the medical officer of health examined him and found he was warranted certification under the Mental Deficiency Act. After several short-term jobs, he found a place as a machinist in a clothing factory. Early in 1947, Straffen began to enter unoccupied homes and steal small items to hide them. He never took them home or gave the items to others. Straffen had no friends and began stealing without being enticed by others. On the 27th of July 1947, a 13-year-old girl reported to police that a boy called John had assaulted her by putting his hand over her mouth and saying, what would you do if I killed you? I have done it before. This incident was not connected to Straffen at the time. Six weeks later, Straffen was found to have strangled five chickens belonging to the father of a girl with whom he had a row. When arrested, he was also under suspicion for burglary and in his police interview, cheerfully confessed to it on many other incidents to which he had not been connected. Straffen was remanded in custody and the medical officer of HMP Horfield examined him, certifying that he was mentally retarded. On the 10th of October, he was committed to Hawtham Colony in Bristol under the Mental Deficiency Act 1913. 
Hawtham was an open colony which specialised in training mentally disabled defenders for resettlement into the community. As Straffen had been under investigation for burglary, certificates stated that he was not of violent or dangerous propensities. He was well behaved at Hawtham and isolated from other inmates. As a result, in July 1949, he was transferred to a lower security agricultural hostel in Winchester. There he did well initially, but fell back into old ways when he stole a bag of walnuts and was sent back to Hawtham in February 1950. In August 1950, Stratham was in trouble with Hawtham authorities when he went home without leave and resisted the police when they went to recapture him. In 1951, Straffen was examined at Bristol Hospital where reading showed that he had suffered wide and severe damage to the cerebral cortex, probably from an attack of encephalitis in India before the age of six. By now, however, Straffen was considered sufficiently rehabilitated to be allowed a period of unescorted home leave. He used the time to gain a job at a market garden, which he was allowed to keep. Hawtham licensed Straffen to the care of his mother, as the family home was less overcrowded. When Straffen's 21st birthday came, under the Mental Deficiency Act, he had to be reassessed by Hawtham, which continued his certificate for a further five years. The family disputed the assessment and appealed. As a result, the Medical Officer of Health for Bath examined Straffen again on the 10th of July 1951 and found improvement in mental age to 10. He recommended that Straffen's certificate be renewed only for six months with a view to discharge at the end. According to the Letitia Fairfield in the introduction to the notable British Trial Series volume Straffen, he had a smouldering hatred and an intense resentment of the police and blamed them for all his troubles from the age of eight. On the morning of Straffen's assessment, a young girl named Christine Butcher was murdered. Fairfield speculates that Straffen saw the press coverage that followed and made the connection that strangling young girls gave the maximum amount of trouble to the police. On the 15th of July 1951, Straffen visited the cinema unaccompanied. His route took him past one Camden Crescent in Bath, where five-year-old Brenda Goddard lived with her foster parents. According to Straffen's later statement to the police, he saw Brenda gathering flowers and offered to show her a better place. He lifted Brenda over a fence into a copse, after which she fell and hit her head on a stone. She was unconscious and he strangled her. Straffen did not make any attempt to hide the body and simply continued to the cinema to watch the film shockproof and returned home. Although Bath police had previously suspected Straffen was violent, he was considered a suspect in the murder and interviewed by police on the 3rd of August. Meanwhile, the police had visited his employer to check on his movements. This resulted in Straffen being dismissed on the 31st of July. In a later interview with a prison psychiatrist, Straffen said that he was under suspicion and wanted to annoy the police because he hated them for shadowing him. On the 8th of August, Straffen was again at the cinema when he met nine-year-old Cicely Bathstone. He first took Cicely to a different cinema to see another film and then went on to the bus to a meadow known as Tumpus on the outskirts of Bath. There he murdered her by strangulation. The circumstances of the crime left many witnesses who had seen Straffen with the girl. The bus conductor recognised him as a former workmate. A court and couple in the meadow had seen him very closely and a policeman's wife had also seen the two together. She mentioned it to her husband. When the alarm was raised the next morning, she guided police to where she had seen the two and Cicely's body was discovered. Her description of the man was enough to identify Straffen immediately as a suspect. Police drove to Straffen's home and arrested him for the murder of Cicely on the morning of 9th of August. Straffen made a statement admitting that he had killed Cicely and also confessed to the murder of Brenda. The other girl, I did her the same. He was charged with the murder and remanded in custody on the 31st of August after a two-day hearing at Bath Magistrates Court. A date was set for Straffen's trial for the murder of Brenda. At Taunton Court on the 17th of October 1951, 
Straffen stood trial for the murder before Mr. Joseph Oliver. However, the only witness to be heard was Peter Parks, medical officer at Horfield Prison, who testified to Straffen's medical history and stated his conclusion that Straffen was unfit to plead. Oliver commented, In his country, we do not try people who are insane. You might as well try a baby in arms. If a man cannot understand what is going on, he cannot be tried. The jury formally returned a verdict that Straffen was insane and unfit to plead. Straffen was transferred to Broadmoor Hospital in Berkshire. Broadmoor had originally been termed a criminal lunatic asylum, but the Criminal Justice Act 1948 responsibility for it had been transferred to the Ministry of Health and those committed to it had been renamed patients. In Broadmoor, Straffen was given a job as a cleaner. 29th of April 1952, Straffen managed to surmount Broadmoor's 10-foot wall by climbing onto the roof of a shed during a work detail. He was wearing civilian clothes under his work clothes. Some hours later, he killed five-year-old Linda Boyer, who was riding her bicycle in Farley Hill. He was captured not long after. Boyer's body was found the next morning. Police questioned Straffen before news reached the hospital, asking him whether he had committed a crime while free. He replied, I did not kill her. I did not kill the little girl on the bicycle, even though a bicycle had not even been mentioned. He was charged with the murder of Linda and sent to HMP Prison Brixton. While awaiting trial since Broadmoor had failed to hold him, a system of sirens to warn off any escape from Broadmoor was set up later in 1952. When Straffen's murder trial opened on the 21st of July, he pleaded not guilty and the defence opted to leave the question of his sanity as an issue to be determined by the jury. At the request of the prosecution, the judge ruled the evidence about the prior murders in Bath would be admissible. That evening, one of the jurors attended a club and declared that one of the prosecution witnesses had murdered Boyer. The next morning, the judge announced that the jury would be discharged on the trial, re-begun with a new jury. The judge required the errant juror to remain in court throughout the trial before calling him to apologise for his wicked discharge of your duties as a citizen. Straffen's defence had called several of those who had seen him in earlier years to give evidence about his mental condition. The prosecution then called prison medical officers and psychiatrists to give evidence. Dr. Thomas Munro, who was a specialist in mental deficiency and had seen Straffen testified that he had said that to murder was wrong, but it was breaking the law and because it is one of the commandments, when Munro asked Straffen to name the other commandments, Straffen could only remember four. For just under an hour, the jury returned with a verdict of guilty which implicitly declared Straffen sane. Mr. Justice Castles sentenced Straffen to death. Straffen appealed on the grounds that the evidence about the Bath murders was wrongly admitted and that his statements on the morning after Linda's murder were wrongly admitted because they had been made before he was cautioned. Both grounds of appeal were dismissed and Straffen was refused leave to appeal by the House of Lords. The date for execution of the judgment of death was fixed for September the 4th. However, on the 29th of August, it was announced that the Home Secretary, David Maxwell Fife, had recommended to the Queen that Straffen be reprieved. After his reprieve, Straffen was moved to HMP Wandsworth. In November 1952, the Home Office denied a rumour that he was about to be moved to Rampton Mental Institution. In 1956, Straffen was moved to Horfield Prison after officers discovered an escape attempt by Wandsworth prisoners who intended to take Straffen with them as a diversion. The news caused extreme concern in Bristol and a petition demanded his removal was organised by a local councillor and signed by 12,000 people within weeks. While in Horfield, Straffen was described by former politician Peter Baker, briefly a fellow prisoner, as always being conspicuous when he was exercising being much taller than anyone else and wearing distinctive clothing for a special watch prisoner. Baker thought the long, emaciated, miserable figure looked like a dying butterfly or a caged animal and reported rumours Straffen made application to the governor each month on the chance a date had been set for his release. 
On August 1958, Straffen was moved to HM Prison Cardiff, where the regime at Warfield was changed to a more liberal one. However, he was reported to have been transferred back in June 1960. Its cell high security wing at HMP Parkhurst was built and ready for the opening in early 1966. The Home Office pointedly did not deny rumours that Straffen had been secretly transferred there on the 31st of January 1966. In May 1968, Straffen was moved to HMP Durham. Placed in the top security A wing, he was joined by another child killer, Ian Brady. Crime author Jonathan Goodman wrote that the Shamblin lunatic is in prison only because no mental institution is secure enough to guarantee his confinement. Many years later, a prison officer recalled seeing Straffen circling, banging the fence every couple of minutes, and that one fellow officer described him as aloof and hostile. Never talks unless he has something to ask for, always on his own. For most of the time that Straffen was in prison, the Home Secretary had to agree to the release of any life sentence prisoner. No occupant of the office was ever willing to let Straffen out. In 1994, Michael Howard decided to compile a select list of about 20 prisoners serving life sentences who must never be released, and Straffen's name was said to be on it. The whole list was published by the News of the World in November. The whole list was published by the News of the World in December 1997. This report confirmed that Straffen would spend the rest of his life in prison. In 2001, with the 50th anniversary of Straffen's imprisonment approaching, his solicitors called for his case to be reopened on the grounds that he had not been fit to stand trial. Investigative journalist Bob Woffington, who examined previously confidential records, uncovered that Straffen had been reprieved after a majority of doctors who examined him found that he was insane. Woffington also doubted Straffen's guilt in the murder of Linda because he had no fingernails which to cause injuries seen on her body and because some local witnesses placed the time of the murder after his recapture. However, Straffen's application to the Criminal Cases Review Commission was turned down in December 2002. In May 2002, the European Court of Human Rights decided a case brought by a life sentence prisoner which challenged the authority of the Home Secretary to refuse to relate after the parole board recommended he be freed. The court decided that politicians should not interfere in life sentences and therefore current practice was unlawful. It was immediately observed that this meant an opportunity for a release for Straffen, who had been in HMP Lawton since 2000. Straffen died at HMP Franklin in County Durham on the 19th of November 2007 at the age of 77. He had been in prison for a British record of 55 years, 3 months and 26 days, or a total of 20,206 days. But I'll leave that one there for now, people. Hopefully you're enjoying the content. Go and look at my playlist of other prisoners serving life without parole. I will be covering 100 cases. If you are enjoying the content, please remember to go and like and subscribe. Thank you.